Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you haven't already, please subscribe as videos come out every week about the CPA process or technical areas. Also, if you like what you see, please give this video a thumbs up. So today, we are going to simplify how to do lease accounting with the use of some examples. And then I'll talk about case writing tips to help you get depth in this area. So today, we're going to go over how important is lease accounting on your exams, what are some definitions we might need to know prior to learning about leases, how to do lease and lease or accounting using IFRS, then how to do lease and lease or accounting using ASPE, and then lastly we'll go through how to get depth in your case writing with leases. So the short answer here is that you'll need to know leases pretty well throughout the whole PEP program. Since even at the core one module you'll need to know this content at a level A, you'll be expected to retain that knowledge throughout your electives and the CFE as well. So now let's go through some definitions that you'll need to know before we continue so you don't get lost from all the lease jargon that we're about to talk about. So the first word we're going to learn about is what is a leasee. That's essentially the party that's going to gain access to that asset. If you think about it, an example of this would be a tenant if you were going to rent out your place. The next word is a leasor. That's the party that will provide the asset, which is normally a landlord if we continue that same example. The next term we want to learn is the date of inception. This is the earlier of the date of the agreement or the commitment. The next term we want to learn about is fixed payments, which are essentially just payments made at regular intervals. The last term here is variable payments, which are payments that vary depending on some future fact or circumstance. So it could be payments that are tied to an index or a rate that is dependent on a future event. So here's a couple more definitions before we get started. The first one is guaranteed residual value. The leasee essentially guarantees the leasor that they can sell this asset for a specific amount. An example of this can be that a four-year-old iPhone will not sell less than $100. The unguaranteed residual value means that there is no guarantee of the value at the end of the lease. The next term is an important one. It's called bargain purchase option, which means there's an option at the end of the lease for the leasee to buy the leased item at a very good deal and it's most likely going to happen. So for example, it could be that at the end of your car lease, you get to buy back the car at $1. So it's most likely you're going to do it. The last definition that we're going to learn is the interest rate implicit in the lease. This is essentially the rate at which the fair value of the leased asset plus initial direct cost equals the present value of minimum lease payments plus unguaranteed residual value. If you're not sure how to actually calculate this, it's okay, because normally this is actually given within the case. So now let's look at IFRS and leasee accounting. There's only one way to account for this, and that's to create a lease liability and a right to use asset. So you might ask, what is a lease liability? Well, it's essentially the present value of the following items at the rate implicit, and if you can't find that rate, you can use the entity's incremental borrowing rate. So the things you need a present value would be the fixed lease payments. And a tip here is to always watch out to see when is the actual first payment. Most of the time, it's at the beginning of the lease, so you need to make an adjustment on your calculator because, by default, they're going to be set to have payments paid at the end of the term. The reason for leases being accounted this way is because you normally pay before you get access to something. Think about renting a condo. You always pay your first month's rent before you actually get to move in. The next thing we need a present value is the variable payments that are dependent on an index or rate. And then if there's any bargain purchase option, we also have to factor that in. And then lastly, the guaranteed residual amount as well. So now let's look at an example on how to calculate the lease liability. So it says, on January 1st, 2022, Infotech entered into a new lease for printers with the following terms. There's annual lease payments due at the beginning of each year for $5,000, Included in these lease payments is the $300 for insurance and maintenance cost. The lease term is five years, and then at the end of the lease, there is a guaranteed residual amount of $1,000, which Infotech expects it will be paid. And lastly, the leases have an implied interest rate of 3%. So prior to starting any question, make sure you know when the lease payments are, and if they're at the beginning or at the end of the term, and then your calculators accordingly. In this example, the payments are at the beginning of the term. And then just a reminder, CP will also give you guys a calculator on the CFI. It's going to be similar to the one that you see on the slide that you can use to enter the present value amounts. So to answer this question, you will enter in 5 as the N, which is the periods, 
Three, as the interest rates, you're not sure what the present value is. That's what we're trying to figure out. 4,700 as the payment, which is the $5,000 of the annual lease payments minus the $300 for insurance and maintenance. And then lastly, your fair value is gonna be the $1,000 residual value that is guaranteed. So if you put all that in calculator and you compute for the present value, you're gonna get approximately $23,000 as the lease liability. So now let's talk about how to calculate your right to use asset. It's essentially the sum of your lease liability, which is what we calculated in the previous screen, plus the money given to you at or before the start date of the lease, plus your direct cost leasing incurs, and then you add in any restoration cost that the leasee needs to incur at the end. In terms of getting depth in this area, you need to talk about the following subsequent measures as well, which is how you actually depreciate the right of use asset. So the depreciation depends on if you intend to keep the item or not. If you don't intend to keep the item, then you'll just depreciate the right of use asset over the lease term. If you do intend to keep the item, then it's going to be depreciated over the useful life of the asset. So now that we're finished the lease section, let's talk about the lease or accounting for IFRS. So the first step is to determine if you have an operating lease or a financing lease, because the accounting treatments for the two will be different. So if you meet any one of these criteria, you're going to be a financing lease. So the first criteria is that, is there any title transfer at the end of lease? The second one is that, is it reasonably certain that there's going to be a bargain purchase option that's going to be used at the end of the lease? Next, we need to see if the leasee receives substantially all the economic benefits of the item over the lease duration. And this can be determined by looking at how long the lease is for, is for in terms of years, and then comparing it to the total years of useful life an item can have. So for example, if you have a car that lasts around 15 years and the lease is for 13 years, it's substantially all of its useful life. So in IRFRS, they don't really give you a solid percentage here, so you have to use your professional judgments to determine what that is. When we look at ASPE, there is some guidance that we can leverage from later on. So the next criteria is that the present value of minimum lease payments are also substantially all of the fair value of the assets. And again, we're using that same term, substantially all, which is vague in IFRS. We don't know what it is, but you have to use your judgment to figure out what that is. A tip to remember is that to be able to get the marks for this criteria and the one that we just talked about, you actually have to do the math to figure out how much is the percentage of the useful life and how much is the actual present value of minimum lease payments when compared to the fair value as well. So the last criteria is that the asset is specialized in a way where it can only be used by the leasee. So this could be, for example, if it's a microwave, the microwave can only cook a specific temperature and can only fit specific foods inside of it. So once you know it's a financing lease, you need to record the sale of asset and the lease receivable as well, which is equal to the present value of the lease payments. And here's an example. So the cost of goods sold will be equal to the cost of the item in inventory. The reason why the item will be in inventory is because the leaser is probably in the business of renting things out, and therefore the items that they're renting is their inventory. As you can see on the slide, the journal entries would be that you're debiting lease receivable for 500, and then you'll also debit the cost of goods sold, which is 100, and then you'll have a revenue of 500 and an inventory of 100 as well. So now let's go through a subsequent measurement example for the leaser. So for example, you received $50 for the item that you rented out. You would first debit cash for $50 because you received it, then you would credit your lease receivable by $50. Next, we would record the interest income. And to do this, you would have your balance of lease receivables minus their payments, and then multiply that by the implied rate of return. In this example, we assume that the balance of the lease receivable is $500, which I got that from the previous slide. And then we would subtract the $50 that was paid, and then we would multiply this whole thing by the implied rate of return, which is 3%. And in the end, you'll get $13.5, which you would debit your lease receivable for, and then you would also credit your interest income for. And that's it. Now you know all about IFRS lease or accounting for financing leases. So now let's move on to see what happens if it's an operating lease. So if something is not a financing lease, then by default, it becomes an operating lease. And if it's an operating lease, then the treatment is pretty easy. Just record the income of the lease over the life of the lease on a straight line basis. 
irrespective of the cash received. See, not everything in leases is that complicated. This was pretty simple, right? Now let's move on to ASPI and how we account for leases. So now let's talk about how to do lease accounting for ASPI. It's similar to how to do lease or accounting in IFRS. You first need to determine if there is a capital or operating lease. You'll notice in ASPI that they use the term capital lease instead of financing lease. And this is a key point because if you start talking about the wrong terminology within your case, the marker might get confused and not give you marks because they might think that you're using the wrong standard. So now let's look at what are the criteria of a capital lease. And again, you only need to meet one of them for it to become a capital lease. The first criteria is that there's going to be a title transfer by the end of the lease or there's a bargain purchase option as well. And that option is very likely to occur. The second criteria is that the lease term is a major portion of the asset's useful life. And in ASPI, they actually tell you that this is 75% or more. The third criteria is that the present value of minimum lease payments is equal to substantially all of the fair value of the asset. And again, ASPI gives you a specific percentage, which is usually 90% or more. Again, make sure you actually do the calculations to determine if the criteria 2 and 3 are met. Also, unlike IFRS, they are not based on judgment. If you have 74% of the useful life, the second criteria is not met. So if any one of these criteria are met, you will have to have a capital lease, which means that you'll have to have a lease asset and a lease liability recognized, which is similar to IFRS. If it becomes a operating lease, then the entity will just expense the amount paid and no asset or liability is recognized, which is similar to IFRS as well for the lease or accounting. So now let's look at how to do lease or accounting for ASPI. Again, only one of the following criteria need to be met before it becomes a capital lease. The first criteria is if one of the criteria from the leasee perspective is met. The second criteria is that the credit risk is normal when compared to the risk of collection of similar receivables. The third criteria is that the amount of any unreimbursed costs that are likely to be incurred by the leasor under the lease can be reasonably estimated. If it becomes a capital lease, the treatment would be similar to IFRS where you would have a leased asset and a leased liability. If it is an operating lease, the entity would just record the revenue received and no asset or liability will be recognized. So now let's talk about the tips for case rating. The first tip is that once you find one criteria is met, you still need to talk about why all the other ones are met or not met. You can't just jump straight to the conclusion. The reason for this is that most likely you will get a mark for each criteria you talk about. So it's up to you if you want to get all the marks or just one. So the second tip is that you want to know when the payments are being made. Is it at the beginning of the term or at the end of the term? Most of the lease payments are at the beginning of the term. Also, you want to know how often are the payments being made. Is it monthly, semi-annually, or annually? Depending on the frequency, that would actually impact your interest rate as well. For example, if you're paid on a monthly basis, you should divide your interest rate by 12. Or if it's semi-annually, you should divide your interest rate by 2. All interest rates are quoted to you on an annualized basis. So the third tip is that if you want to get depth in leases, you need to talk about how to amortize the lease asset after you recognize it, and how you need to test for impairment at the end of each reporting period under IFRS. The fourth tip is that when you're given a case in ASPI or IFRS, make sure you are using the right terms. For example, in IFRS, it's called financing lease, and in ASPI, it's called capital lease. Also, you don't want to refer to the 75% and 90% threshold when you're using IFRS. You don't want the marker to think that you don't know which standard you're applying and you're mixing up the two standards. When you look at the discount rate in ASPI, you get to use the lower of the rate implicit or entity's borrowing rate. In IFRS, you have the choice to use the rate implicit or the entity's borrowing rate. Lastly, if the case doesn't explicitly tell you what is the entity's incremental borrowing rate in the leases section, you might want to see if there's anywhere else in the case where it talks about the entity borrowing money from the bank or another user, and you can use that as the entity's borrowing rate. And that's it. Thanks again for watching my video on leases, and I hope that now you have a better understanding of them. As always, if you liked what you saw, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe. New videos are coming out weekly. If you didn't, maybe you should just keep watching until you change your mind.
If you have any comments or questions about today's video, please let me know in the comments below.